This is indeed an evening of tribute, celebrating the American Zionist movement and a quarter century of leadership. But we go way back. As a people, we go back thousands of years. And as a people, some have chosen to attack us, to malign us, to hold us to multiple standards, to defame us, to attempt to destroy us. Elon S. Carr serves as the special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism for the United States of America. As the special envoy, he advises the Secretary of State and accordingly the President of the United States. He advises all of us. He has come here tonight very particularly to pay tribute to a singular concept that of equality, equality for the Jewish people, that we should not be viewed as different, we should not be the targets of hate, and we should stand together. You should know, Special Envoy Carr, that earlier today, in cooperation with the World Zionist Organization in Jerusalem, 60 rallies against anti-Semitism were held around the world. And everybody here participated in a rally that says, hate stops here. I could spend a long time introducing you, but I will not. Because who you are speaks for itself. But more importantly, what you stand for speaks for itself. We all want you to know how honored we are that on behalf of the President of the United States, on behalf of the Secretary of State, on behalf of the entirety of the United States government, that as one of us, you are here and you came here to stand with us against hate. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ilan Eskar, Special Envoy. I certainly do stand with you. Certainly do stand with you. My goodness, what an honor this is. First of all, what an honor to be introduced by Richard. Richard and I became great friends years ago when he was president of B'nai B'rith, and I've watched his extraordinary leadership of the Jewish community, of the Jewish people, watched in wonder. And uh, not only have we become great friends, but we are A.E. Pi brothers, and that is a relationship of great meaning to me and to you. And Phyllis, my goodness, what can we say about you? Phyllis is a one-woman army, what she does. It's, uh, it's just tremendous, just tremendous. Uh, Herbert, uh, thank you so much, Herb, for, uh, for having me and, uh, and for your leadership of AZM, uh, which, is, uh, which is really uh, an organization that stands for unity. That's what AZM is. And that's a very, very important concept for our people today. Uh, I have to say a personal word about AZM, because uh, uh, some, some of you in this room know uh, my mother used to be the executive director of AZF at the time. And so uh, I, I was a young kid <clears throat> running around the hallways of 515 Park Avenue, where used to be, now I'm really dating myself, used to be the headquarters of the Jewish world. And I would uh, sprint, actually, not run, sprint as a little kid around the hallways. And when I got invited, I said, Herb, you sure you want me back? <laughs> I didn't think I'd be welcome. Um, but it's, it's no exaggeration to say, all kidding aside, that, uh, that 
Uh, one of the sources of my education in Jewish leadership was, was you, was AZM. I remember, it is true, I remember as a young kid seeing my mother come to work and, uh, by the way, she preceded Karen, right before Karen. Um, and uh, someone preceded Karen. And, uh, and I remember seeing her come to work and work hard and with passion uh, for, for the Jewish people and for the state of Israel. That was the memory of my childhood. And so if I stand before you today uh, with a title that obligates me to fight to protect Am Yisrael everywhere in the world, it's in part due to you, to AZM, and to the wonderful example that you set for me as I grew up. So thank you. I owe you for that. And chazaku varuch on everything you've done year after year, in and out, to, uh, to make our people stronger and the state of Israel safer. Um, speaking of my mother, when she was a young girl in Iraq, she remembers one morning a knock at the door. It was early in the morning, and her father, my grandfather, still had shaving cream on his face. He answered the door. The soldier said, Mr. Somech, you're coming with us. And my mother watched her father, my grandfather, be dragged away. He was paraded through the streets in leg irons like a slave along with other Jews in the community. And then he was subjected to a Stalinist show trial. And he was accused of what? What do you think he was accused of? Zionism. He was accused of being a Zionist. What does that mean? We all know what that means. He was accused of being a Jew. Specifically, his charge was that he was at a rally in Baghdad distributing anti-government propaganda. And when he heard the charge, he said, wait a minute, Your Honor, I can actually prove that I was in Basra that day. I wasn't even at whatever rally this is. I'll bring witnesses. I was working at the, for the British port of Basra. And the judge said, you are challenging the charges in this case? For you, five years. Everyone else got three at his level. For you, five years, for having the audacity to defend yourself. That was his crime. And so my mother did what no young girl should have to do. She visited her father in prison. They were going to leave the country, but they didn't. So for two years, they would visit him in prison until finally he said, leave, flee, don't wait for me. And so my grandmother, my mother who was nine at the time, and my uncle who was a toddler fled across the border to Iran, a very different Iran from today. The Shah was helping Jews escape and giving Jews asylum. They escaped to Iran and from Iran to Israel. So when I am Talking about anti-Semitism, my friends, let me tell you, I get it. That story is emblazoned on my family's collective history. The images of her father being paraded through the streets in leg irons will not leave my mother. And so we know what anti-Semitism is. And then I married the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. My wife's grandmother had a number, a tattoo on her arm from being in Auschwitz. And her grandfather was also in Auschwitz. Both were liberated by Allied troops. Our people's history is a history of being driven from one place to another, desperately seeking refuge, looking often in vain for the protection of one or another diaspora country. And how blessed we are that this is the United States of America for all our problems, for all of our imperfections, for all of what, Rabbi, you mentioned recently, disturbing as it is, is the most philo-Semitic country ever. Not only do I get what anti-Semitism is, I want to talk about my boss. The President of the United States is absolutely ferocious in his determination to fight for the Jewish people. He is unequivocal. He is unvarnished. In the State of the Union address, by the way, I was announced in this role, on Tuesday night, the night of the State of the Union Address, two hours later was, was the State of the Union Address. There isn't a lot of space in that speech. It's the most prominent speech any president gives all year. And what did he do? He spent a lot of time recognizing, honoring Holocaust survivors. But he didn't just honor Holocaust survivors. He called anti-Semitism a vile poison that we must root out everywhere in the world. 
That's what he just said a few weeks ago. After the Pittsburgh massacre, the same day as the Pittsburgh massacre, he said something more extraordinary. He stood before a rally having nothing to do with the events in Pittsburgh. It was a rally in Illinois. And he said before a crowd of supporters cheering for him at a rally in Illinois, he said, we stand with our Jewish brothers and sisters in the world. We will root out anti-Semitism. We must root out anti-Semitism. And then he made a promise that is unprecedented. He said, those who seek the destruction of the Jews, we will seek their destruction. We will seek their destruction. I actually didn't realize it at the time, but Ambassador Ron Dermer later, I met with him and he said, I want you to know something about that statement. Never in world history has a leader said, if you go after the Jews, we're going after you. It's never been said in world history. That's what was said at that rally in Illinois. Secretary Pompeo, my boss, adores the Jewish people, has devoted himself to protecting the state of Israel and fighting anti-Semitism everywhere in the world. You want an example of how these two men want to lead our country? Well, I'm a military officer. I served in the US Army, still do in the reserves. I spent nearly a year in Iraq leading an anti-terrorism team. And before this job, I was a criminal prosecutor in Los Angeles. I prosecuted gangs, household names like MS-13 and 18th Street. I'm not your typical political appointee. The President of the United States and the Secretary of State picked me for this job because they want the same ferocity and the same force brought against anti-Semitism that a military officer brings to the enemy and that a criminal prosecutor brings to a violent felon. That's what they want and that's what they're going to get. That's what they want because, ladies and gentlemen, they understand that this is a crisis. You understand that this is a crisis. Rabbi Schneier, you said it so beautifully. This is a crisis. Anti-Semitic incidences are increasing the world over. In one country in Europe alone, in France, there was an increase of 70% in attacks against Jews in one year. In Belgium, hate against Jews quadrupled on the internet in one year. The yellow vests in France have erupted in anti-Semitic canards. In Eastern Europe, we've heard some governments make statements about the outsider Jews subverting our countries. It is in every, in every region of the world, in every rhetorical flourish, and in every method of attack. I want to give you an example. One week alone, one week alone, what my office dealt with, we had this horrific attack on the chief rabbi in Buenos Aires, which may have been motivated by money, but of course, any attack on Jews has to include anti-Semitism. And so there were anti-Semitic canards. You chief rabbi, we know you're the chief rabbi. They broke his ribs. In the same week, I dealt with a book fair in Oman. Oman, by the way, no radical regime there. I'm a great admirer, let me say, of the Sultan of, of Oman. We've made wonderful progress in Oman. There was a book fair in Oman where the titles of the books sold in Oman, I have, I have the, the pages, it's, it's page after page after page of Mein Kampf, the Protocols of Elders of Zion, the International Jew, very other, other po potpourri of anti-Semitic titles, page after page, <clears throat> highlighting a book fair in a, in a progressive Arab regime in the Gulf. I'm not even talking about other regimes progressive Arab regime in the Gulf. And then we had a horrific parade in Belgium where, where uh, Jews were depicted in, in caricatures that could come out of Der Sturmer with hooked noses, a sitting on bags of money, a float like that paraded through the street in Belgium. This was within one week, within one week. Think of all the canards mixed in that, in that one week. We have an attack on a rabbi. We have, we have Nazi, uh, Nazi anti-Semitic propaganda translated into Arabic. And, and we have the, the classic uh, depiction of Jews with money and with hooked noses like, like monsters taking over the world. That's what we're dealing with. And so my friends, 
I want to lay forward here tonight a few principles that will govern our work in the coming years. Principle number one is we are not going to ignore any ideology or any region. Jew hatred is Jew hatred. If it comes from the ultra-right, <clears throat> couched in the terms of ultra-nationalism, if it comes from the left, we will combat it regardless of the ideological clothing in which it dresses itself. Jew hatred is Jew hatred. And we're going to have our crosshairs on it. And we won't ignore any part of the ideological spectrum. Nor will we ignore any region. Sometimes this is thought to be an office that focuses on Europe. There's a lot of, lot of bad news coming out of Europe. But Latin America has to be addressed. And the Arab world has to be addressed. And we have more chance to make gains in the Arab world today than we have in years. So I'm not going to ignore any ideology. And I'm not going to ignore any region of the world. Principle number two, we are going to call out the enemies of the Jewish people. We're going to be public and we're going to be strong. We're going to pressure those who are recalcitrant. But also, we're going to empower our friends. I want to tell you some good news, not all bad news. There's a lot of bad news, but let me tell you some amazing news. When the secretary announced my appointment, I was at Dulles Airport taxiing on a plane, literally. I mean. Talk about hitting the ground running. I flew to Europe literally as I was being announced and represented the United States at two conferences. I flew to Bratislava, well, to Vienna, and then to Bratislava. And in Bratislava, I represented us at a conference of the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, massive bilateral uh, organization that came out of Helsinki with 57 countries. The first conference organized by Slovakia in its position as rotational chair in office of the OSCE was a conference on anti-Semitism. First thing they did. After representing us there, I traveled to Brussels and I represented us at a conference on anti-Semitism of the EU. The first conference that Romania convened in its role as rotational president of the EU Council was a conference on anti-Semitism. There are friends of ours in Europe who get it, truly get it. They see that this is a conflagration. And they're asking, what is going on? I heard eloquent voices of European leaders. I'm not talking about Jews. Eloquent voices of European leaders who said, we cannot allow this to happen again. What is happening to our continent? And these leaders understand that anti-Semitism isn't only about the Jews. If it were, by the way, if it were only about protecting a beleaguered and persecuted and killed minority, that would be reason enough morally to fight it. But they understand that it's about so much more. They understand that anti-Semitism is about the future of their of countries and the future of their continent. Because anti-Semitism is perhaps history's greatest barometer of human misery. Every society that has embraced this this notorious evil has rotted to its core. Every society. And every society that has made anti-Semitism a part of its definition has produced human misery in a scale that defies description. And so you want to improve the human condition? You want to make things better for the children of the world? Those who are internationalists who believe in the children of the world? By the way, so do I. You want to help the human condition root this out? Because anti-Semitism will guarantee human suffering. That's its history. And it's not only I saying this. There are Europeans who say it. And they understand it, and they stand up, and they talk about it. And so part of my job is not only to punish the enemies and to pressure the recalcitrant, but it's also to empower our friends. And I will empower those allies with the full weight of the United States of America, because they are doing good work. And they need to know they have our, uh, we have their back. And they will know that. And lastly, principle number three. And I saved the most important to last because this is the American Zionist movement. I talked about the rise in attacks against Jews. I talked about the rhetoric. But let's talk about what else is rising. A far greater rise, the biggest rise, is in the new form of anti-Semitism that clothes itself in the language of anti-Zionism. Consul General Dayan, what an honor to have you here tonight. Ambassador Dayan, you do God's work. And you said it so beautifully from the podium today 
to turn Zionism into a four-letter word? How dare they? This is the anti-Semitism of the college campus. This is the anti-Semitism of the so-called elites. It is the anti-Semitism of polite and sometimes impolite conversations in the halls of, of European governments and in the halls of some governments closer to home. And let me tell you something. It will be my mission to tear down this fake distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. There is no distinction. There is no distinction. <laughs> Zionism is who we are. Zionism is what our people believe. Zionism wasn't invented in 1948. Zionism didn't spring out of the first Zionist Congress. Zionism was born in Parashat Lech Lecha. <laughs> Zionism reached its consummation in the Exodus, in Yitziat Mitzrayim, when Moses led our people to the Promised Land, to Zion. And Zionism became a feature of diaspora Jewry, not 100 years ago, 2,600 years ago. 2,600 years ago in the first diaspora where the captives of Babylon wept on the banks of the Tigris and Euphrates and swore, swore in their longing to Zion. As you said it, Ambassador, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may I forget my right arm. That is what Zionism is. It is a defining feature of who we are as an ethnic group and a nation. It is a central tenet of the Jewish religion as a faith. And anyone, anyone who attempts to steal from us, to steal from us our identity, our beliefs, our self-definition, our property rights in the land of Israel, anyone who does that is trading in anti-Semitism, pure and simple. And I will say it everywhere I go and with every breath I have. And so that will be our work. And we have our work cut out for us. But I want to conclude by talking about you. Because let me tell you, I can fight anti-Semitism. And we will. And I'll fight anti-Semitism with the full backing of the United States of America. And that's not too bad. But to defeat anti-Semitism? spiritually to end this, this indefatigable poison, even the United States can't do that by itself. For that, we need something more. And that brings me back to AZM. The purpose of AZM is achdut, unity of the Jewish people. That's why this organization exists. That's why the Conference of Presidents exists. It's to produce Jewish unity. And Jewish unity, my friends, is not a luxury. It is a necessity. I want to tell you a story. It's not a good one. Two months ago, a student leader, wonderful young man, happens to be an AEPI, but that's not why he's wonderful. <laughs> he's a student senator at Stanford University. And he introduced a resolution to have Stanford adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which by the way is a wonderful, it's a game changer actually. And it's, it's been adopted around the world and I've been urging uh, additional countries to adopt it and many have. Not controversial, by the way. In the OSCE, there are 57 countries. The vote on adopting it for the OSCE was 56 to one. 56 to one, Russia. Um, Everett Dirksen, Senator Everett, Everett Dirksen once said, two-thirds? He says, you can't get two-thirds for a Mother's Day resolution, right? <laughs> 56 to 1 to adopt it. Not controversial. And so he put forth this, this student legislation at Stanford University. He had pretty much unanimous support until Jewish groups came forward and said, do not support this. We don't support this. We come from privilege. 
We should be focusing on oppressed minorities. We are not an oppressed minority. Do not support this. He lost all support, had to pull the bill. That was in October. In the intervening two months, things got so bad at Stanford that a student leader said that Jews control the media and Jews control Stanford. And then a visiting lecturer minimized the Holocaust in a lecture to students. That's what happened at Stanford. Things got so bad that he said, now I have it. And so this is fresh news. Two weeks ago, he reintroduced the bill. This time, he had total 100% support of the Senate. Until Jewish groups came forward and said, we get it. We get it. Anti-Semitism is, is, is on fire on this campus. We'll withdraw our opposition that we expressed in October only if you take out the Israel stuff. Take out the Israel stuff. And so Matt faced a, a decision. Do I pull the whole thing and go home? Or do I, do I at least get something? He decided to get something. So he changed the wording. And so what passed at Stanford University is that it is anti-Semitism to beat up Jews. Newsflash. But to demonize Israel? To delegitimize our Zionist aspiration? To do that? Have at it. Green light. You know who did this to us? We did this to us. This is a self-inflicted wound. How can we win? How can we win when we do this to ourselves? We have got to come together. This is not a request. This is an urgent charge. We are lost without unity. That is our history. We are in the month of Adar Bet. We just started at Chodesh Tov, by the way. And we're about to celebrate Purim. Thank you again, Ambassador, for talking about Purim. And as the Ambassador said, what does Mordechai say to Esther? For this you are here. God put you here for this reason. Please, please intervene. Save your people from extermination. Mind you, Purim. Purim is a holiday that focuses on real, good old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Not temple worship, not freeing slaves. No, no, the real genocidal anti-Semitism that we've seen far too many times in our history. That's what Purim is. The historical effort to exterminate the Jewish people. And Mordechai said, please, save your people. And she said, I'll do it. I'll do it, but first, First, you tell the Jews of Persia to fast for three days. Sit and fast and mourn for three days. I will do that too. And on the third day, I will risk my life and go to the king. And the rabbis asked, why the fast? Because Esther understood that without Jewish unity, we can't accomplish anything. But when the Jewish people stand together, when we stand as the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai, there is nothing that can't be done. Even the deal to kill the Jewish people that was signed and sealed and delivered, the imperial decree that could not be undone, the wheels of genocide that were already beginning to turn, even that could be undone if we stand together. That's the message of Purim. And what does it mean to fast and to mourn, to wear sackcloth and ash? It means to take responsibility for each other. Hashomer achi anochi, exactly right. It means to take collective responsibility for the Jewish condition and for each other. That's what it means to fast for three days. And when the Jewish people do that, there is nothing that can't be accomplished. That's the message of the holiday we're about to celebrate. And so my question is, my friends, Jewish leaders in this room, you who have devoted yourselves to the Jewish condition, what are we going to do about this? This fragmentation, this inability to come together on key issues, what are we going to do about it? And I say to you today, as the envoy that will do our work together, be our partners. Let us do it together. We can disagree on a lot of issues. God knows we know how to do that. But when it comes to our survival, when it comes to our future, when it comes to our children and our grandchildren that look upon us with trusting eyes and expect us to bequeath to them a world that is better, 
When it comes to that, there can be no disagreement. If we really understand that, if we resolve to leave these conferences changed, not to move on and say it was a nice conference, but to really understand what our obligations are because that's the purpose of the gatherings like this, if we do that, then we will work tikkun olam b'malchut shaddai. And we will make our world a better place. And that is what our children and grandchildren deserve. Thank you, my friends, for your leadership. Thank you for everything you do for Am Yisrael. And I look forward to working with you.